Good morning. Welcome to Move Ministries. It's a good thing my friends are here because they keep me on time. It's 8.30. We got to get going. So happy Wednesday. Happy Bible study. Um, are we not most blessed among all people that this morning we get to be in the word of God and we get to be here together and we get to just open our mouths wide and see what God has for us. Just receive from him what he has for us. So um, thanks for joining me. I'm so glad that you're here. It's such a blessing for me to have other people um, share in the excitement and the joy of scripture with me. Like it, it like multiplies my joy. I, I just, I just, I love it. And so I'm excited because I always am because it's scripture. There's nothing that to not be excited about this. So my husband said to me this morning, he said, how are you going to get through all of this? There is so much here. And I thought, well, number one, great news at this point. I don't have to do anything but open my mouth, right? So I'm not going to do anything, okay? But um, also that, uh, secondly, by the grace of God is how we're going to get through all of this. And thirdly, in this study, in the way that we're studying scripture, I mean, we are covering massive amounts of Bible real estate, right? This is a, this is a huge passage. We're really getting an aerial view, right? We're getting this up, up, um, sky view and then there are going to be points where we kind of come down and look at things a little bit more closely because really what this chapter is about is three a record of three miracles that god does right that's that's really what this is and these three miracles set the stage for what continues on in the rest of the book through the holy spirit so we don't want to get too overburdened we're going to get these details because some of these details are like they're like the tasty little morsels along the way right but we want to have this aerial view so we have a real understanding we want to walk away from the book of acts with this real understanding of of what this book is about right and who is this book about god right? And the Holy Spirit, his workings of the Holy Spirit. All right. So make sure that your Bibles are open, your study guides are open, and that you have a heart that is ready to receive from God. Let's begin in prayer. Father, God, almighty, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the almighty. Almighty means you are the one who overpowers. God, you have the final say. Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the testimony, the record of the lives of these people in the beginning of your church. Father, let us remember that how you worked in this Acts church is how you work in the Acts church of today, how you still work in your bride. Father, that you are still the God that overpowers. You are still the God that changes lives. Lord, let us never lose hope in that. Let this morning be given totally over to you lord it is for you it is about you it is all as on to the lord receive the blessing receive the glory let this fragrant be a fragrant offering unto you in jesus name amen okay again make sure that your bibles are open let's do a little bit of a review so we saw in chapter seven the most christ-like death that i believe is recorded in all of scripture in the death of stephen as he prays lord do not hold this sin against them and stephen's death serves as sort of the the final drop in the teacup that pours out the message of the gospel into uh judea and samaria because at this point it had sort of been somewhat contained in the city of jerusalem and so it's it's overflowing remember back to acts chapter 1 verse 8 i know i keep referring to that but that's really the framework of the whole book is how the gospel goes from jerusalem to samaria to judea to all the ends of the earth all right, and so we are just in this profound moment of the church as the, as the gospel begins to spread. And why is this so profound? I mean, as a Jewish nation, this would have just blown their minds that salvation is going to be offered to Samaritans. And we're going to see actually in chapter 10 how, how the message of salvation is going to be offered to the Gentiles. This would just, right? It doesn't blow our minds because most of us are Gentiles, right? All right, and so God in chapter 8 confirms his work through the Holy Spirit. God is doing exactly what he said he was going to do through the Abrahamic Covenant, right? The Abrahamic Covenant says that all nations will be blessed through these people. 
all nations are going to receive the message of the gospel. And so Peter and John go to Samaria to confirm that the work of salvation is being done in the hearts of these people of Samaria. They lay their hands upon the people and they receive the Holy Spirit. And so just as there is today, there was in their day, people who look to the miracles of God. Remember we talked about how the miracles are nothing more than a finger that is pointing to the miracle worker, right? And so we saw that in um, <clears throat> in uh, the sorcerer, Simon, I'm sorry, but Simon, we saw that in Simon that he looked to the finger, put his faith in the finger and that he was going to, he wanted to purchase the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we see this in people today too, when they say, oh, if I could just see a miracle, then I would believe. It is not the miracle that causes belief. It is the miracle worker who causes the belief. And so God is about to do his greatest miracle in this chapter. And that is of changing a heart, of radically turning someone, okay? That's what kept coming to mind as I went through this chapter is this radical turn, this U-turn, okay? Remember the word for repentance is actually turning, to turn. So you are going at a force, you are moving in this direction and all of a sudden, there is a turn, okay? I'm gonna use a water skiing term because my brother loves to say this. We talk about being able to turn a boat on a dime and that means it's able to make this turn where it's like, it turns turns on a dime. It's able to turn so quickly. Okay. And so we're going to get into a little bit deeper about the character of Saul. Now, excuse me, because um, if I, if I use Saul and Paul interchangeably, I'm going to try to stick with the name Saul because we're, he's being referred to as Saul right now. Saul, the Jew, as we go on with the book of Acts, we're going to see Saul, um, change we're going to see that name change where he uh they refer to him as um paul and that would be his greek name okay so it's almost as if luke is like chomping at the bit to share with us uh paul's stories he gives us like these little details about who paul is but he waits because the holy spirit says no there's there's more of this story that i want you to tell and so what do we know in chapter 7 verse 59 this is what we know about about Saul is that he is a young man. This means that he is a man in his prime. So probably a man somewhere in his 30s. He witnessed the death of Stephen. He approved the death of Stephen. He most likely also heard the gospel presented through Stephen. Remember Stephen went through that long sermon where he talked about this history of Israel rejecting God and God wanting this relationship with his people and them rejecting it. Okay, what else do we know? He, like I said, he was in hearty agreement with the death of Stephen. He was also one whom Stephen prayed for. Do not hold this sin against him. We also know that Saul was ravaging the church. Remember that word for ravaging was like when, a, when an animal pulls meat off of the bone of another animal. It is a very violent and aggressive um, behavior. And so Saul would have most, would have been most, least likely, been voted least likely to be a convert of Christianity, okay? The church is looking at Saul and they are terrified of him. I wonder how many people were actually praying for his conversion. Wouldn't that be interesting to know? Or how many people just thought that that man is beyond hope. I really feel like this is a chapter for those of us who have lost hope. This is a chapter for those of us who have prayed fervently for years for people or for situations that we thought were outside of the grace of God, outside of the mercy of God broken relationships, broken people, and we have lost faith in a God who turns things around. This is the chapter for us. This is a chapter reminding us that there is no situation, no relationship, no person outside of the grace of God. It gives me goosebumps already just to think about it, okay? So let's get on with it. Chapter nine, verses one and two. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So we have this picture of Saul, this 
angry, violent man. He is so consumed with ridding the world of these people of the way it's it, it's coming naturally to him. It's 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 as if he's just it's as naturally as breathing comes to us. That's how natural it was for Saul. He is just uh, just ravaging and consumed by this and and we're going to see that god is about to take this breath away literally so saul sees christianity is now spreading it is spread all the way to damascus why is this significant damascus is about 130 miles away from jerusalem and it is outside of israel so the gospel has moved, has extended out the borders of Israel. This is significant, okay? Because it is no longer contained in this itty bitty country. It is spilling over. And um, and so Saul sees it necessary to go to the highest levels of their religious authority and get letters so that he may legally bring these people bound, meaning in chains, back to Jerusalem, okay? And and I love how Luke, Luke is very um, gender sensitive. He always includes men and women. Women are not exempt. He's going to drag women out of the churches. So like I said, Damascus is far away. This is a six day trip. So Luke sees this, these the churches that are forming in Damascus as a very serious threat. All right, and I love, notice this, underline it, highlight it, do whatever, that he says any belonging to the way. Okay, the world has plenty of religions and, and still mankind um, comes up with, with new ways to invent um, different religions. This, this is not a religion. This is a way. This is a way of life that Jesus Christ so consumes these people that, that he in infects or affects every part of their lives. When Christ comes into you, that's what he wants to do. I love this example um, that I read in one of my devotionals as it was talking about the Holy Spirit. Often when the Holy Spirit comes into us, we think, I'll give him a, a guest room in my home, right? He can stay in this in this little part, right? And, and usually it's the, you know, when I walk into church, the Holy Spirit can have free reign over my life. But then when I walk out of the church, I now have free reign over my life. This is not how the Holy Spirit works. This is not how following the way of Christianity works. The Holy Spirit affects every part of your life from the way that you raise your children, from the way that you speak to and love your husband, from the way that you keep and manage your home to the decisions that you make, the places that you go, the books that you read, the vacations that you take, the money that you spend, Everything is affected by this way of life. And so Paul sees this as a real threat. Okay, so um, why is this such a threat to Paul? Why is this such a problem for Paul? All right, we're going to flip over. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Philippians chapter 3. It gives us, Paul gives us a real good, um, and if you don't have your Bible, just look on with someone else. Um a real good picture of why this is such an issue for him, his way of life. Paul, it's uh, we're going to chapter three. We're going to be in verse four, five, six. Um, yeah, okay. And just, if you have a little piece of paper, just stick something in there because we're going to come back to this. Okay, so Paul had every reason under the sun to have absolute confidence in the flesh, confidence that by his own qualifications, he could make himself right with God or righteous. That's what righteousness means. Righteousness means that you have been made right with God. Okay, so let's look at this. In verse four, it says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone, anyone had a mind to put confidence to the flesh, I far more. So what he's saying is like, if you, however good you think you are, I was far greater. And let's see why. First, he says, verse five, circumcised of the eighth day. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant promise of God's people. And they were to be circumcised on the eighth day. Paul was, and this made Paul unique and set apart. His parents closely followed that which was prescribed in the scriptures. And he is set apart from birth, day eight, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel. <clears throat> He's not of the diaspora, but his heritage, his bloodline, his genetics, all could be connected back to Israel, the land of promise, right? He is a child of the promise in the land of the promise of the tribe of Benjamin. 
Benjamin is somewhat of an elite tribe in that when um, all of the other tribes, uh, minus Judah, defected from King David, Benjamin remained with King David. He is of the same tribe, uh, Saul is of the same tribe of the first king of Israel, King Saul, that is his namesake. King Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, and Benjamin, um, the city of Jerusalem, was in the land that was allotted to Benjamin. So this is a very elite tribe. That's the tribe that Paul is from. So we're beginning to see why, pride, why, why Paul could have so much pride in his flesh. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. His parents, their parents, their parents' parents, their parents' parents' parents, all Hebrews. He came from a pure bloodline. This would have been very important to a Jew. He came from a Jewish family that maintained their Jewishness in their traditions, in their language, in their laws, everything about them breathed Jewish, right? He was a Pharisee. What did this mean that Paul was a Pharisee? This would mean at the age of two, at the age of two, his parents would take a scroll of the law and they would cover it with honey and they would have the little two-year-old lick this scroll. And that was a way of saying that your words are sweeter to me than honey. So at that young age, he would understand the importance of the word of God. I think it was by age five, he would have memorized the book of Leviticus. I know by the age of, um, of, uh, of his teenage years, he would have memorized the whole Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, plus the prophets, plus Psalms. So when mama has you memorize like a verse a week or whatever, you have nothing to complain about. This man knew the word of God. It was written upon his mind and it's going to be written upon his heart. Zeal, verse six, zeal. This is this energized enthusiasm. That is the way in which he persecuted the church. That is the way in which he saw his righteous duty. Uh, Jews highly exalted zeal. It was this religious zeal and love and fervor. And it's, it, it was a way of loving the law so much that you hated, despised, and rejected anything that threatened the law. And that's how Paul saw Christianity as threatening the law. And then lastly, he says, I was blameless in righteousness. That meant that he kept the law so perfectly externally on the outside. No one could blame Paul. No one could condemn him. He was perfect and flawless in the law. So just like I said, just keep something in the book of Philippians. We're going to come back to that because we're going to see how Paul later viewed all of his credentials, right? This is a very impressive resume. Like when I think about myself, I think about like, okay, what were, what are the things that I could put on my resume that might be impressive, right? Well, you know, I was of the family of the Kowalskis. I am now of the family of the Ryans. I have this degree and that degree and I live in this kind of house and we make this much money and I have this kind of car and I have this, all of these things that distinguish me. How do I view those things in the light of knowing Christ? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna dig into that a little bit further. Okay, so Paul is on his way to Damascus. He is on his way. Let's go back to uh, verses 3 through 9. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, 130 miles away. He's getting close. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Can you, can you hear me that? Honey? Yeah. Okay, so if you're a visual learner, here you go. We have our Lego demonstration. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he, and he said, who are you, Lord? This is such an important question. And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. This is a man on a mission. He is a Mack truck, moving at 100 miles an hour, 
picking up speed. Can you almost, you can almost sense his breath increasing in these murderous threats as he gets closer and closer to Damascus. What's our only hope here? Our only hope is that he could possibly be stopped, right? Like maybe he'll have a heart attack. Maybe something will happen that he is stopped and God despairs us, right? Or maybe our only hope is that he just kills us quickly. Just, just, just kill us now. Don't drag us to Jerusalem. Don't like put us in the Colosseum to be ripped apart by lions. Just if there would be some way that he could just be stopped. Oh, but we serve a God who can do so much more. See, this is where the hope comes in. This isn't our only hope that he would be stopped. Our, our greatest hope lies in what God can do in the human heart. He's not only going to stop Saul, but he's going to turn him around. He is going to turn him in the opposite direction. Look at verse 3. Okay, so suddenly this light flashed all around him. This wasn't just like, oh, like a flashlight. This was a light. Um, it's in uh, Acts 22, verse 6, that says that this was actually at noonday. Noon is the brightest time of the day, right? And even at the brightest time of the day, this light overpowered and outshined the day right? The brightest part of the day. This was a consuming light. Even we just looked at all of Paul's qualifications. If anyone had reason to think he was walking in the light, it was Paul. And yet Jesus Christ says, I am the brighter light. I don't care how righteous you think you are. I don't care if you think you're going to stand before God and say, well, I was a pretty good person. His light far outshined that of Paul. And in response to this light, what does Paul do? He hits the deck, right? He flat out falls to the ground. This makes me think of, remember when Jesus was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and the guards come to them and they say, you know, who are you looking for? We are looking for ja Jesus of Nazarene. And they, and, and G what does Jesus say? I am. And in response to hearing him declare his divinity, I am, <clears throat> they all fall over right? It's, it's, it's that exact same thing in the presence of God. Whenever people claim to be in the presence of God or claim, claim to be in the presence of, of an angel and they don't fall over, I'm sorry, that does not match the biblical, uh, the biblical, biblical truth, okay? So he hears this voice and this voice says, Saul, Saul. It's a, whenever we see those voices, um, uh, God repeating names like that. It's there's there's a great deal of intimate emotion behind that. Like what if my mother would say to me, Amy Joy, right? That's my middle name, Amy Joy. I say Lily Joy or Emily Nicole. It's it's a term of intimacy. Is this not so precious that this one who is doing such great havoc and damage allegedly to the church? God comes to him, Jesus Christ himself says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What a great question. You think you're doing me a favor, and yet I see you as a great persecutor. God accuses Saul the righteous of a crime. His crime is hostility towards Jesus Christ. And know this, God does not take hostility towards his children sitting down. He does not take hostility towards his children idly. We saw that with Stephen, right? When Stephen was treated hostily, Jesus Christ stood to welcome him into the kingdom of heaven. Know this, if you are one who is being persecuted for the righteousness of Christ, God knows it and God sees it and he takes it as literal persecution. When we come into Christ and Christ comes into us, when we are ill-treated, he sees it as you are doing it to him, right? I can tell you this when, um, if someone mistreats me, okay, fine. Someone mistreats my brother, my sister, my children. Now we got a problem, right? We got a real problem. And that's, the same with Christ, right? Once we are in him, he is in us. You belong to him. You don't mess with his kids, right? And that's what's happening here. Okay. Oh, it's, it's so amazing. This is so great. Oh. Saul's whole mission is stopped right here. His whole mission is about to be turned around. And so Saul is blinded. 
up to this point, Saul's blind and he doesn't even know it. He is spiritually blind. He has missed the Messiah. And now Jesus says, you are going to be physically blind and not being able to see, and I'm going to start calling the shots. Look at this. Okay, so let's let's go back to verse 5. First, Paul says, who are you, Lord? There is no more important question that we need to answer than to say, who is Jesus Christ? Paul spends the rest of his life answering and in pursuit of this question. Okay, um, all right. Oh, now I lost where I am. Where are we going in here? I got too, ex too excited. Okay, so who is the Lord? Paul is going to spend the rest of his life, like I said, answering this question. And remember I said in Philippians, what is his response to this? How does Paul now, how is he going to now view all of his credentials? Back in Philippians chapter 7, this is what Paul says. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for Christ, all of those things, all of the things that he held with such regard, he now counts as a loss. More than that, I count all things in, to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says to Christ, who are you? He spends the rest of his life pursuing this, pursuing knowing Jesus Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so I may gain Christ. All of those things, when he says I count them as rubbish, he says that, that word rubbish literally means animal manure. That's how I see this. This is nothing but animal feces to me compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. And that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him. That was Paul's greatest value, to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. Amazing, isn't it? This is Paul's greatest value goal. Okay, and it says in verse 9 that he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. This for a Jew to not eat or drink for three days would um, imply that there that this was a time of repentance. Repentance means turning around. Remember I said this man is, is moving forward with such a force that he's breathing threats and murder, right? Our only hope is that he might be stopped and yet we see we have a much greater hope that it would be turned around. Think of the situations in your life. Think of this God whom we serve, who has the power to not only stop these situations, but turn them around and cause them to go in another direction. It's amazing. It's amazing. Let us not lose faith and hope in his power to do these things. Okay, so now we see Saul, this man, this powerhouse, is broken, right? He is blind. Jesus is now calling the shots. I will tell you where to go. I will tell you what you are going to do. And I'm, gonna t I, I'm, I'm calling the shots, okay? And so Saul sits in darkness for three days, neither eating nor drinking. That's a serious humility. That is a seriously humbling situation for this man who thought himself to be a powerhouse. Here's something else for us to know. When God breaks a human being, he never breaks them without the intention of building them back up again, without the intention of making them something they never could have been before, without that brokenness. I think of the times in my life where I have been utterly broken, where I have felt like I am nothing but shattered pieces and how God gently and mercifully puts those pieces of my life back together so I may be a vessel that is useful to him, humble, no longer prideful of my accomplishments. Verse 10, <clears throat> now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. That's a ready servant, isn't it? And the Lord said to him, get up, go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man for, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. 
He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many from many about this man and how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen servant of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So, like I said, here we have a disciple that is ready. <clears throat> and God is very specific about what Ananias is supposed to do. He gives him the street that he is supposed to go to, the, the, the street called Straight, the house of a man named Judas, the man that he is supposed to see, Saul of Tarsus, what he's doing. He is in prayer. He is praying. <laughs> the vision, bless you, honey. And uh, the vision that he saw, saw Ananias. God is asking uh, Ananias to do something very scary and very bold, right? And so God, these, these specifics about what is happening uh, are almost essential. And we can't really be too hard on Ananias because this is something really scary. The reports of Paul have already traveled up to Damascus. They know Paul's activity. They know he's coming and they know that he is coming with the authority of the high priest. This is scary. And yet Ananias says, you know what? I, I, I'm going to obey and I'm going to go. God makes his directions very clear. Go. Paul the persecutor is about to become Paul the persecuted. He says, Paul is going to suffer for my name. And so it's very, I love this. And it's in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Why did God say Paul? Paul tells us, I love this. Again, it's in um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. This is what he says. But God had mercy. What does that word mercy mean? God gave me. I did not get what I deserved. Paul deserved to be struck by lightning, and 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 it would have been a great thing, right? Like if, if the church saw Paul was struck by lightning and he was killed, it would not have been a good, great thing. It would not have been a great thing because we don't really have the... We knew... What we know of the New Testament is through Paul's epistles, right? We would have wiped out all of those epistles. Okay, but God had mercy on me. This is the reason he was saved, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience. God's great patience with even the worst of sinners, the chief of all sinners, then others would realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. There is no one and nothing that is outside of his grace. Someone needs to hear that today. Someone needs to be reminded of that today. We This may be a truth where we're like, yeah, yeah, we know that, we understand that. But do we? Do we live it out? Do we pray like it's true? Do we witness like it's true? Who have we given up on in our lives? What situation have we said, this will always be this way? This has too much force. This has too much power. God is called God the Almighty for a reason. He is the great overpowerer. Okay? Let us have faith to believe in the God Almighty. All right. So, uh, so let's go on. Verse 17. So Ananias departed, entered the house, and after laying hands on him, brother Saul. Ananias now calls him brother Saul. Nothing has happened. This is the faith that believes in the incredible grace of God as he puts his hand on Saul and calls him a brother. One, someone who is of your family. That's who you call a brother. He is already recognizing him as a brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He regained his sight, got up and was baptized, took food and he was strengthened. What happens here? This is the turning. This is the turning point. He was blind. He could not see. Why are we so... Uh, we lack such understanding when people don't get Jesus, when people don't get the gospel. Okay, I can't see. I can see nothing. 
Okay. So when you're preaching the gospel to me and I'm like this, okay. And you're telling me why, why, why are we so surprised at this? Okay. God caused these scales to fall from his eyes. God intersected in this man's life, caused these scales to, to fall from his eyes. And all of a sudden Paul could see well, no wonder. I mean, I, this is the exact experience that I had. I mean, scales didn't literally fall from my eyes, but all of a sudden I could see and I'm like, oh, I get it. I totally get it, right? God had to intersect in my life. God had to come into me. I had to come into him before I was able to see. Total turn of events. It's a miracle. And, and, and when this sort of thing happens, we almost have, we have to pause and take note of God doing a miracle. This is a miracle. Okay, now for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately, immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, plural synagogues, saying he is the son of God. What was his whole intention of coming to the synagogues? What he had letters to drag these people out bring them 130 miles back to Jerusalem. He's doing the exact opposite. He's coming into the synagogues as a man of peace, declaring Jesus to be what? The son of God. This is not a natural father-son relationship, okay? This is when you would say, they would know exactly what this means, okay? When you say the son of, that means you are of the same essence, you are of the same identity, you are of the same nature. He is proclaiming Jesus Christ to be God. This is the exact thing that got, this would be blasphemy to a Jew. This is what got Jesus murdered. And he, he's going into the synagogues, proclaiming him to be the son of God. The, immediately, this is profound. But remember, he is a true disciple. And so therefore he cannot help but to witness of Jesus Christ complete turnaround again why is this so important first john 5 12. this is real simple why this is so important that jesus is the son of god when you say who remember paul asked that question who are you lord we must ask the same question who are you lord there will be there are people who worship jesus the nazarene right they say he was a good man he was a moral man i want to pattern my life after him there is a big difference between saying Jesus the Nazarene and Jesus the Son of God. He was both, right? He must be both. Jesus the Son of God. Listen to this, 1 John 5, 12. This is real simple. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Paul thought he had the life through his own righteousness. Without the Son, you do not have the life. It's very simple. You cannot stand before God and say, I was a pretty good person. Here's my resume. You will only be able to stand before God and say, I have the son and therefore I have the life. Wow. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 21, all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who was in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who have come here for the purpose of bringing them before the chief priests? They're like blown away. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus Christ, that this is Jesus Christ. That word confounding, I love that word in the in the NASB. It's this, you're, you're causing this, this surprise and shock and, and confusion because he's acting against expectations. Their expectation was that he was coming to drag them away to Jerusalem. And now they're seeing, no, that's not at all what he's doing. He is proclaiming Jesus Christ to be the son of God. Remember, Paul has an extensive, Old Testament knowledge. He is a Pharisee from the age of birth, right? That this was bred into him. He knows his Old Testament, but now he has an understanding of the Old Testament like never before because he sees Jesus Christ in the Old Testament and how this man, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. Unbelievable glory be to God. Verse 23. 
When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul, and they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Okay, so let's go back to verse 23 because we have we have more happening here than we, we actually see. Many days is actually a period of three years. So how do I know that? Um, if you go to Galatians uh, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, Paul actually says, I was in Damascus and Arabia for a period of three years. So there's there's kind of a, a, a chunk of time here. And um, Paul was most likely converted between 34 and 36 AD. So right here, we're around 37, 39 AD. Um, and, and he's gaining this, this group of disciples. Uh, this, he refers to um, this experience in one of his epistles as, as being very humbling as, as Paul is, um, has to escape the city. He's being put in a basket and lowered outside of this city. So it's it's just a very humbling and humiliating experience for Paul. But we see from verse 16 where, where God said, he's going to suffer for my name. Here we see Paul, now the persecutor, who is now the persecuted, being lowered out of the city in a basket. All right, verse 26 through 30. When he came to Jerusalem, remember how he left Jerusalem as a persecutor? Now, three years later, he's coming back to Jerusalem. He was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. This is one of the ways that we know that we are a disciple, is that we suddenly have this newfound desire, as we follow the way, to be with people who are of the family of God. You know, we, we did see this in COVID, didn't we? That when we were in lockdown, that we, we couldn't be with the family of God as we desired. And so there was this, this desire to be with the family of God. Verse 27. Oh, see, here we have the buts of scripture. But Barnabas. Do you remember Barnabas from chapter four? He was called the, the son of encouragement. He was the one who sold his plot of land and bought brought all the proceeds and laid it before the disciples, did the disciples' feet. So now we're reintroduced to Barnabas. So everyone is afraid of Saul, but Barnabas took hold of him, brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And when he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord, and he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. So again, we see the next, the second threat on his life. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So Barnabas intercedes for Paul. Barnabas kind of steps in and says, believes in this greater grace, just like Ananias, that, that there is this possibility that this man who was the chief of all sinners could be saved, could be redeemed, could now be a useful tool in the life of the church. I want us to notice the location. Remember I said Paul had left Jerusalem three years before a persecutor. He's now going to leave the city of, of, of Jerusalem again as one who is being persecuted. All right, and so um, now between verses 30 and, and 31 in this time, we have a time period of anywhere from eight to 12 years okay, in, in Saul's life, where he is sent away to Tarsus, okay, and so um, God has completely turned his life around, he's going, sent back to his hometown, and, and his ministry is, is relatively obscure, we don't know a lot about what, what's happening, it's possible that he, he set up some churches, but this would have been a real time of preparation for Paul, so we see him sort of explode onto the scene, and then he's sort of pulled back, right? And sometimes God does this in our life where he, he has this season of where he had broken Paul, okay? And now he takes this time to build Paul back up because there's a lot left in Paul's life where he is going to use him. But God takes this time. God is never in a hurry. We have our own timeline, right? Where we want things to happen like, oh, I'm getting older. Or this is happening. I got I to gotta get this done. And God, God says, look, because I am God, and I am outside of time, 
I am in no hurry, and I will take my time in shaping and molding you into the disciple that I want you to be. All right, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Don't mistake this, that the persecution stopped. The persecution is ramping up. And how do I know that? In this time, there was a major leadership change. First, the high priest was no longer Caiaphas in 37 AD. There was a change. And there was also a change in the Roman emperor was um, uh, Caligula was the Roman emperor. And he was notorious for his hatred of Christians. But it's amazing that in the midst of this persecution, God builds up his church. He edifies his church. And so we see these three locations, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Remember, if you remember back to um, the study of the Gospel of Luke and how Jesus spent a great deal of his ministry up in Galilee, didn't see a single conversion. And now the church, what where Jesus spread all of these seeds, are now there's now a great harvest of Christians in this Galilee area so they're enjoying peace they're being built up and then we have these these two sort of conflicting words they're going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit right when you are afraid you want comfort right and when you are comforted you feel no fear so like, how are they in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit? Like, it doesn't really make sense, right? Well, that word, when they say the, the fear of the Lord, here's what that means, is they are standing in awe of the power of God, which is what we just saw. Luke takes a lot of time telling us about the conversion of one single man because it shows us the power of God. And the church is standing there like this, right they're just in awe of the power of god and then this comfort of the holy spirit think of the comfort of the holy spirit as the eye of the hurricane right what's so cool about the eye of the hurricane is that there's peace there's calmness sometimes there's even blue sky in the eye of the hurricane right that's right where the church is there's this sense of inner peace right and it is because they have the life that only comes from knowing the sun because no matter what happens on this life they've already begun their eternal life they already have this peace that transcends all understanding because they have the peace of god that comes from knowing the sun okay so like i said this whole chapter is really about these three miraculous records right and they're going to set us up for what's going to happen in chapter 10 and in the rest of the book and so we're going to come back to peter and so it says in verse 32 now as peter we can almost say there meanwhile right paul's has been converted he spends these three years in in damascus and arabia then he's off to tarsus what's happening sort of meanwhile peter's ministry okay uh so here's what peter's doing now, as Peter's traveling through all these regions, that's important to note, right? Because the disciples prior to were just staying within Jerusalem. Now they're going out, right? Now they're following this command. And Peter is, the, the pattern has changed. He came, he came down, this is verse 32, he came down also to the saints. This is, we, um, saints mean those who are set apart, who lived at Lydia. And there he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up, and all who lived at Lydia and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. So with Paul, like I said, the only hope that we had is that somehow this man traveling at this force would be stopped. We see this man who has been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. He is paralyzed. What's our only hope? Our only hope is that things don't get worse, right? Sometimes that's our only hope in life is that we think, look, I just hope things don't get worse. And then they do, right? Isn't that, isn't that we think this must be rock bottom. This has to be. 
This man was, was really without hope until Jesus Christ intersects his life. This man had no hope that he would ever get up, right? This man had, to, to say, one day you're going to make your bed, he would have laughed, right? Like he would have settled for, oh, if I could, if I could perhaps raise my arm, if I could perhaps be used in some way. And God says, look, I am, your paralysis has now hit a wall and I'm gonna turn it around. That which was once useless, your arms and your limbs, I am now going to make useful to the point that you may get up and make this bed you've been laying on, you're now gonna make it. It's a miracle, right? It, it, it brings us back to this fact. God can change anything. No one is outside of this. We don't want to, uh, faith healers, give this false hope that, oh, if you only have faith, you can be healed just like this man. It is according to God's will. If it is God's will that you would be healed, you will be healed. It, let me reassure you, it is God's will that you will be healed and made whole either in this life or the next. We can begin having that hope right now that God will do that. Okay, because he's a God of restoration. Okay, write that down, make note of that. Our God is a God of restoration from Genesis to Revelation. It is his desire, it is his great hope, it is his great love that he might restore his people. Oh, okay. Now in Joppa, verse 36, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is Dorcas. That name means um, a gazelle or deer, but it also means beloved fits her so perfectly. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went to him then. And when he arrived, they brought him into the upper room. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. All hope is lost here. There's no hope of this being turned around. Verse 40, but Peter sent them all out. He knelt down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up, calling the saints and widows. He presented her alive, and it became all known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Like I said, this too appears to be a completely hopeless situation. What hope did they have? They didn't have any hope. Peter clears the room. I think he clears the room because he wanted to make sure that it wasn't Peter who got the glory, right? Peter was the finger that was pointing to the one who was the miracle worker. And so Peter kneels down, prays before the miracle worker, and the miracle worker reverses, turns around this hopeless situation and restores life because he is the God of restoration. What's the result of this? What is the result of these miracles? The result is that people look beyond the finger to the miracle worker and the lives of many people are turned. It says back in verse 36, they turned to the Lord. There was a turning here. It says here in verse 42, many believed in the Lord. To believe in the Lord is to turn, to go in the other direction. Verse 43, Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. What an unusual way to end this chapter, right? Why do we care about why Peter is staying with a tanner? It sort of leaves us hanging for the next chapter, and I'm just going to let it linger. There is a reason, and it's amazing, and it's awesome, because in the next chapter, God, well, in this chapter, God has shown us no one is beyond his grace, his mercy, and his saving love. 
no one is outside of a restored relationship with God. Okay, it's so awesome. All right, so I'm going to leave that dangling. We're going to pick that up in two weeks, and I'm going to tell you why this is so amazing that Peter's staying with the tanner and what God is going to do in the next chapter uh, is just awesome. And so Luke writes about the Almighty God, the one who overpowers who or what is in your life that seems to be overpowering you. Find the peace in knowing the God who overpowers and overrules. Let's pray. God, we just thank you that you are the almighty God. We thank you that you are the God who does miracles. Father, but we want to not look for those miracles, but the one who is the miracle worker to put our faith and trust to come into him, have him come into us and have the life that comes from being in the sun. Father, I pray that any who are hearing me might know that life, Lord, and that they might follow the way of Christ and be restored to a right relationship with you, that they would count everything on their resume as rubbish compared to knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Answer that question for people today, Lord. Who is the Lord? Show yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. God's blessings be upon you. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you in two weeks.